For our last section, we're going to be talking about explosives and explosions. And some of the things we're going to be learning about when we talk about explosions are the definition of an explosive and the definition of an explosion. And explosions might not be exactly what you're thinking of because there's a couple of different types of explosions that we're going to be dealing with. One is referred to as a physical explosion and one is referred to, referred to as a chemical explosion. We're going to be looking at these two different types. We're also going to be explaining the characteristics of a physical explosion, what causes it, show you some examples of some physical explosions. And then we're going to define and characterize some chemical explosives. And there's two different types of chemical explosives. One's called a low explosive, and the other one is called a high explosive. Then we're going to be talking about identifying and describing the types of damage that's caused by an explosion. And what we're going to start looking at tomorrow are some of the procedures for evidence collection in an explosive scene once you've, you're doing the forensic uh, examination of an explosion scene, some of the procedures you need to go through, and talk about how some of the explosive evidence is analyzed. But that's going to actually be for tomorrow. So the first thing we want to do is we want to define an explosion. Everybody knows an explosion when they see it, but what is it actually? Well, it turns out the official definition of an explosion is the violent, rapid expansion of gas. It's just a gas that spreads out very, very quickly. That's what's considered an explosion. Now, an explosive is something that can cause an explosion. An explosive is a chemical that reacts with something else or by itself that produces gas very quickly. And then that gas will undergo a violent, rapid expansion and thus be an explosion. But we don't actually need an explosive to have an explosion. I'll explain the difference in a minute. Types of explosives. One explosive is a propellant. Now, this is a type, a group of explosives that are designed to use this rapid expansion of gas to move objects in a particular direction. So think about your rocket engines in this case. What we're looking at is we're directing the movement of the gases to produce motion. So in other words, we create this rapid expansion of gases, but we allow the gases only to leave one particular outlet and it forces an object forward. Now, a chemical explosive is usually the reaction of a rapid oxidation. And here's where it actually ties into the stuff we talked about before, because when we were talking about uh, fire and arson, we were talking about oxidation, chemicals combining with oxygen to release heat and energy. Well, in this case, it's the same thing. The only difference is in an explosion, we're releasing this energy much, much faster than in a fire. So we're still creating gas, we're still releasing heat, we're releasing energy, but we're releasing it much, much quicker in this case. Now, of our two types of explosions, we're going to talk about the physical explosion. This is one that a lot of people don't consider, but as you're going to see in the videos, these are explosions. It's the release of gas from a pressurized container. In other words, the gas is, is squeezed down, it's under high pressure and then we just release it very quickly. So in other words, the gas is already there. We're not using chemicals to create a gas. We've already got it. Although another example of a physical explosion might also be phase change. We've got a particular substance and it rapidly turns into a gas. That can also be an explosion. That's still considered a physical explosion because you're not really changing what the substance is. You're just causing it to expand very rapidly. For example, if we take H2O, we take water as a liquid, and we rapidly turn it into a gas, that can be considered a physical explosion. And I'll be showing you an example of where that happens in a minute. Here's kind of what I mean about a physical explosion. 
this isn't not what you would consider an explosion, but technically it is. We've made a little balloon car. What he's going to do is he's going to pump up this with gas, and the gas inside the balloon is under pressure because the balloon is squeezing it. Let's take a look at what happens. There's he's blowing up the balloon. Now, right here, the balloon is under pressure. The gas inside the balloon is under pressure, and it's actually being squeezed out. But because it's being directed through this little pipe right here, this pressurized gas here can be actually referred to as a propellant. It's not a chemical change, but it's still propelling the balloon in a particular direction. So that's one example of a physical explosion. Not too dramatic, so let's take a look at some more dramatic ones. First off, the gas cylinder failure. Uh, these are these tall gla uh, gas cylinders where people store everything from carbon dioxide to nitrogen to even oxygen, the big oxygen tanks. Let's take a look at what happens when one of those fails. So here's that type of gas cylinder filled with some gas or other. Let's take a look at what happens. When a typical cylinder is filled to its design pressure of 2400 PSI, it will contain almost 300 cubic feet of atmospheric pressure gas or about 160 times the internal volume of the cylinder. This compression of gas represents a tremendous amount of stored energy. If the outlet valve is broken off, the sudden release of compressed gas can turn the cylinder into a missile with energy to shoot through a cinder block wall. In one reported incident, a damaged cylinder penetrated two sheet metal walls before becoming airborne and exiting through the roof. The tank reached an altitude of 140 feet before falling back through the building's roof a second time. When a steel cylinder becomes a projectile, it can move with great force, at high speeds, and in unpredictable directions, with the potential to cause serious or fatal injuries. So you can see in that case that the gas cylinder was acting like a propellant. But there's a couple of others that we could take a look at. One of the ones we're talking about changing from a solid directly to a gas is liquid nitrogen. Now, if you have liquid nitrogen in a bottle, as soon as you start heating it up, that gas is going to want to expand. So let me show you a couple of videos. First, we're going to take a look at just pouring liquid nitrogen from a container and letting it warm up to room temperature all at once. So what we've got here are a couple of people, and in those buckets they have there, that's liquid nitrogen. So nitrogen is not a gas. It's in the, it's in the liquid phase. But this container right here, I believe it contains, it's an inside container, but it's surrounded by warm water. So this is actually slightly, somewhat above room temperature. And what you're going to see happening is the liquid very quickly hits its, um, its boiling point, and the gas is going to expand all at once. So take a look at this. And you can see right there, if I just want to rewind up a second here, you see right here the explosive force. It actually shook the camera. Let's watch that part again. That was fun. And there you go. You also saw the barrel itself kind of hop up and down. So that's an example of... Um, a liquid turning directly into a gas. No chemical change here, but it is still considered an explosion. And of course, one of the most dangerous ones that we can run across in our lives is a hot water heater. Now, a hot water heater, uh, basically it's a large tank of water where you heat it up, and there's only safety precautions on it. But if you ever um, have a bad hot water heater, it's very, very rare because like three things have to go wrong. What will happen is the hot water tank will start filling up, not with water, but it'll heat up the water so much that it'll turn into steam, and the steam keeps building up. Now, hot water heaters have a safety valve, so this doesn't cause an explosion, but if the safety valve is broken and a couple of other things are broken, it could actually heat up and heat up so much that it actually causes an explosion. So this is a clip from uh, Mythbusters where they did this hot water heater. And if you ever get to watch this episode, uh, Hot Water Heater Explosions, they'll go through and explain why this really can't happen on a regular basis. You really have to be trying to blow up your hot water heater. But let's take a look at what happens with this. 
utter heat of rocket, the boys were blown away by their 30 gallon water experiment. See that part right there? That's the actual explosion. Just watch how the container actually blows outward. By their 30 gallon water experiment. But what we didn't show you was what happened when we ramped up to a 52 gallon tank. Small, no boom. Medium, boom. Extra large, kaboom. It's the same type. It's set up the same way with all the safeties removed. Everything's the same except it's larger. So I would expect that this is going to blow up exactly the same way, uh, but it's going to be a little bit more energetic. To measure just how energetic, Jamie lays out shock watch stickers around the tank. When these water heaters explode, they make a big bang just like an explosive. Now that produces a shock wave. Uh, we want to see exactly what that shock wave is. is. Is it actually comparable to a couple sticks of dynamite? At least this time, the guys know where to look. Straight up. Do you want to spot how high it goes in the air? OK. See if you can. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, that's pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, they count up the mounting pressure. We're at about 265 PSI and uh, climbing rapidly. So be on your guard. Anything could happen from here on in. Over. We're now at 300 PSI, double what the tank's rated for. Be on your guard. Now, if you take a look right there, the reason why the tank goes shooting upwards was when it takes off, the weakest part of the hot water tank is the bottom part, and that kind of blows out the bottom. And now all the gas, instead of acting more like a, an explosion outwards, it's an explosion through that one container, more like a propellant. And you see the little bottom of the tank. Okay, everybody in here. Lucky we were all on our guard. The heater pushed off the ground with a mighty amount of thrust. Look at how high! Down it comes. Now. <laughs> wow. Look at the guys applauding over there. Wow, that was just around 315, and that acted just like a rocket. Okay, so as I've been saying, that can never happen to a regular hot water heater unless you really want it to. But there was another type of boiler. Uh, these are the big industrial ones like we have in the basement of the school for our, for our heat, where we heat up water. And what happened in this case was they only had a small amount of water in the tank, and they had the tank turned up really, really high for a maintenance procedure, and there wasn't supposed to be any water in there. Let's take a look at what happens to this big water boiler when it went off. Okay, so here are the big boilers right here. These are filled with hot water to help heat up a building. So this isn't an experiment. This is something that actually happened. Glad he left the room because there it goes. The same expansion of gas. That was in slow motion. That's the result. It blew a 10 meter, like over a 5 foot. This, that's the hole in the wall. So, we don't need a chemical reaction to cause an explosion. An explosion is rapidly expanding gases. So now we're going to take a look at the second type of explosion, and that's a chemical explosion. And a chemical explosion, as we told you about, consists of two different types. This is a chemical that's going to create a rapidly expanding gas. And the two types of explosives you can see here are the low explosives and the high explosives. And the high explosives are actually broken apart into two parts. So let's take a look at what a chemical explosion and a chemical explosive is. Again, these are gases created by a reaction of compounds. And it's usually due to an oxidation. And you're thinking, that's just like fire. You take wood, you take oxygen, you take some heat, and we get the oxidation of the wood. And it creates a gas. The difference is the explosive itself will have both the fuel and the oxidizer in it. So instead of using oxygen in the air, we're going to use a chemical in the explosion, in the explosion to generate the oxygen. So we don't have to worry about the air for the oxygen. 
And I guess something similar to this was if you remember the uh, the poor gummy bear that we tossed in the burning potassium chlorate. We used the potassium chlorate as a source of oxygen and heat, and then we threw the gummy bear in for fuel, and we got that rapid oxidation. Now, low explosives are gases. It's a chemical reaction that creates a gas, and the gas travels less than 100 meters per second, which is still really, really fast. You can tell a low explosive because it has what's called a deflagration or a flame front. Here's your Hollywood movie type explosions where you see the giant fireball of flame. These guys right here, you see, you can see the flames shooting out there. Those are low explosives. There's actually a time release. There's the first, the second, and the third part. And what this does is it creates a pushing force. In other words, the rapidly expansive gases actually creates a shock wave, a pushing force goes out that, that pushes outwards. Now, the composition of a low explosive is different from a high explosive. In a low explosive, we have two things. We have a flammable fuel and we have some chemical to provide the oxygen. For example, gunpowder, gunpowder contains three main components, carbon, sulfur, and potassium nitrate. The carbon is actually the fuel, and the potassium nitrate provides the oxygen. The sulfur is actually just a catalyst to help the reaction run better, but really the carbon and the oxygen from the potassium nitrate actually react. You can see it here, three moles of carbon, one mole of sulfur, two moles of potassium nitrate. We end up making three moles of carbon dioxide and another mole of nitrogen gas, so we start off with all solids, which take up almost no space. And for each reaction, we generate four moles of gas, which are going to take up approximately 10,000 times the amount of space. So this quick reaction in gunpowder is actually creating an expanding gas, which is 40,000 times the volume of the original solids. Now, there's different types of powder of gunpowder. And depending on how you mix the chemicals together, you can make slightly different types of low explosives. There's one called smokeless, which doesn't, um, like most gunpowder, doesn't generate any smoke. What we're going to be using is a chemical called nitrocellulose, which is an organic compound with a lot of nitrates in it, instead of carbon. And then we'd use the sulfur and potassium nitrate as well. And these materials are actually quite easy to obtain. Low explosives aren't all that hard to make if you know where to look. Um, find, find carbon. Um, that's not very hard to find in, in many places. Potassium nitrate's a little bit tricky, but if you know where to find it. Um, potassium chlorate, like the one that we used in uh, the gummy bear experiment, can be found in match productions. Nitrates can be found in fertilizers. One reaction that we ran before, glycerin and potassium nitrate. So here we go, potassium permanganate mixing with glycerin. About 10 grams of potassium permanganate was added to a suitable dish. Crystalline potassium permanganate was used. If a powdered form is used, the reaction is gonna go much quicker. Then about five milliliters of glycerin was added. Glycerin also goes by the name glycerol. The overall reaction is shown above. The potassium permanganate reacts with the glycerin to form potassium carbonate, manganese 3 oxide, carbon dioxide, and water. So see here, we've got our fuel and we've got our oxidizer, which is going to be providing the, uh, the oxygen. Well, actually, this is going to be the oxygen that provides the oxygen to react with this to create a bunch of different chemicals. But it's the same idea this that it's an oxidation. Redox reaction, which is short for reduction oxidation. In short, reduction is the acceptance of electrons while the other is accepting. In our case, the potassium permanganate is receiving the electrons and the... So here we go. We've got smoking. You can see it's bubbling a little bit. And there's your flame. Now, in the beginning, he said that he used crystals of potassium nitrate. Yeah, there's a lot of energy being given off. If you use the powdered form, this occurs much quicker and you get a much more rapid expansion of gases. 
So those two chemicals are actually easy to find, glycerin and potassium permanganate. They actually, I saw for sale one time at Walmart as a fire starter. You pour those two chemicals together, even over some wet wood, and the heat's going to dry the wood out and actually set it on fire. So all you really have to do is mix an oxidizer with any organic fuel. You can even take something as simple as um, sugar and really concentrated sulfuric acid. And that'll oxidize sugar and create a lot of smoke and a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of gas. And the idea is if you put this in a solid container, you've got yourself a pipe bomb. And when the gas expands, expands, expands until it blows out the sides of the container, then it's going to shoot pieces of the container all over the place. And that's actually what a pipe bomb is. A lot of unscrupulous types will also pack nails or other sharp objects in with the oxidizer and the organic fuel. So not just the case of the pipe bomb is the shrapnel blowing out, but it also has nails and things of that sort. So now let's talk about high explosives. High explosives are a little bit different. The gases travel over a thousand meters per second. And in this case, it can go as high as something like 8,500 meters per second. So some high explosives can, can make a gas that travels much, much, much faster. And that's where the damage is going to be caused. This is now going to create a shock wave. This is going to contain, you can see sort of the shock wave here pushing outwards. This, you can see like the air here being blown. You can see the water here being pushed out because the gas gets so compressed and forced outwards that it just pushes things along with it. This is the compressed air that was compressed from the explosion traveling outward. And it can go so, so fast and so hard that it can actually break objects. You've seen windows getting blown out, but it can also damage buildings. But high explosives have an interesting composition. They're actually made of two explosives. One's called a primary explosive and the other's a secondary explosive. And the primary explosive is something that's going to be very sensitive to heat, friction, or shock, something that's going to explode rather easily. There's some chemicals, if you've ever played with those little blasting caps that you can just throw at the ground and they pop, that's that's resistant, that's a, a, um, a primary explosive that's uh, very sensitive to shock. There's also other chemicals that'll react very quickly to heat or even to the heat generated by friction. And the reason why you have a primary explosive is it generates enough energy to cause the secondary explosive to generate. The secondary explosive has a high activation energy. We have to we have to get the energy. We have to add in a lot of energy all at once. When I talked about the thermite reaction, I said it's a very dangerous reaction, but it has a high activation energy, and you have to use the heat from burning magnesium, a sparkler, to get it to run. That's kind of the idea of a high explosive. The primary generates the activation energy to set off the secondary explosive. That's why they use things called blasting caps. Blasting caps are primary explosives that actually give off enough energy to set off the secondary explosive. Now, you want to talk about a chemical that's sensitive to, uh, to shock or to friction, nitrogen triiodide. It's very difficult to make. You have to be very careful, but this guy has made several layers of nitrogen triiodide and he did it in a fume hood so nobody would touch it. But let's take a look at what happens when it's irritated. We have nitrogen triiodide set up on five pieces of filter paper here on the ring stand. And if it does what it's supposed to. So that, something like that, is going to give us enough energy to create the activation energy to set off the secondary explosive. Here's some example of the primary explosives. Lead nitride. Lead nitride is nice because lead nitride can be set off underwater. That's what it looks like. This chemical, lead siphate, is sensitive to static shock, uh, like a little static electricity, setting that one off. 
And tetrazine, like the nitrogen triiodide we just looked at, is sensitive to impact. You see a lot of them have this nitrogen compound in them. Nitrogen's really great for explosives. So your secondary explosive is going to release much more energy. And again, it has a very high activation energy. But once we reach that activation energy, it gives off lots and lots of energy in this expanding gas. TNT, trinitrotoluene, is a good secondary explosive. There's another chemical called RDX, another chemical called PETN, HMX. There's ANFO, which is really kind of a nasty one. ANFO is actually a military-grade explosive. RDX and uh, Semtex are actually what uh, some people refer to as plastic explosives. But TNT is trinitrotoluene. It's insensitive to water. In other words, you stick this thing in water and it still works fine. It doesn't degenerate, it doesn't break down when you place it in water. Dynamite's a little bit different. Dynamite is a solid material that's soaked in nitroglycerin. If you know anything about nitroglycerin, that has a, a very bad reaction to any type of physical impact, shock. So it's like the nitrogen triiodide. The nitroglycerin is actually going to provide the, um, the necessary activation energy to cause the reaction. And dynamite's actually more powerful than simple TNT. The problem with dynamite is that it's really kind of unstable. It's hard to manufacture. So it's not really in, as in, used as much as it used to. There's other things we can use instead. ANFO, for example. It's ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. The ammonium nitrate's the oxidant, the fuel oil. That's what's going to be burned to produce the gases. It's easy to obtain the stuff, unfortunately. Fertilizer has a lot of ammonium nitrate in it. And fuel oil, many people use that to heat their homes. So it's easy to get their hands on. Oklahoma City, um, that was a situation where a guy parked a truck filled with ammonium nitrate and fuel oil in front of the federal building in Oklahoma City. And he actually caused a lot of damage. This was the result of one explosion. He basically blew like a third of the building off. He had parked the truck like right in front here. Uh, he was a domestic terrorist. He was angry with the federal government. So he ended up blowing off the section of the building simply by using these two simple to obtain chemicals. Now, something that's a little harder to work with, is harder to obtain, is C4. And that's 80% of that RDX and the 20% of a chemical called a plasticizer. And what the plasticizer will do is it makes it pliable. So C4 has the ability that it looks sort of like Play-Doh and it can be shaped into different shapes and can be packed into different things. Um, it's very useful to, to make a shape charge out of this. Now C4 is, there's an example of it right there. C4 is... Um, something that uh, you can actually light this stuff on fire and it'll burn. It'll slowly burn and release energy because you haven't hit its uh, activation energy. So C4 is actually very stable and very easy to, to carry around. But then you stick the detonator for the C4 in there. The, C, the detonator is actually the primary explosive and the C4 itself is a secondary explosive. And that's where you get the huge explosions. Now, let's talk about the strength of an explosion. It can be measured by what we talked about. We talked about heat of uh, fires, uh, delta H, how many joules of energy are released per gram or per mole. But it's often compared to a standard. Explosive, explosions are often compared to a standard. And there's one called the power index. And the power index compares the explosive force to a chemical called picric acid. There's another one you might have heard of which is called the TNT equivalent, comparable to the explosive firepower of TNT. There's the TNT equivalent. You can see something like nitroglycerin is more explosive than the same amount of TNT. Here's what's the, the power index, and this is comparing it to this chemical called um, picric acid.
So we can see gram for gram how explosive, how dangerous some of these chemicals are. Now, what are the damages caused from an explosion? Well, there's actually a few. Damage, you can get hurt or your property can be damaged from an explosion by the shock wave. Or could be damaged as a result of fire caused by the explosion. Or it could be caused from flying debris. So we got three different ways that damage and injury can be caused from an explosion. Taking a look at the first one, the shock wave. Now, the low explosives don't generate enough of a wave, a shock wave. It's not even actually even called a shock wave. Um, when those things go off because they're not very strong at all. So when you have a high explosive, that's when we start referring to it as a shock wave. And it's the compressed gas. And this compressed gas is coming out as a wave. And what could happen is if this wave of compressed gas hits something very strong, like a brick wall or a building, it can actually force that compressed gas to travel in a different direction. So you could get an explosion going off and then the shock wave gets forced into a smaller area and causing even greater damage to other objects. And then what happens after this goes off, after this big explosion goes off, the gas is expanded so rapidly. Well, now there's kind of a void when the gas cools down. So now the gas compresses and the air rushes back into the point of the explosion. And that's going to take the broken debris and pull it back in towards you. So you've actually got a second type of, of flying debris. And it actually occurs very, very quickly. It's hard to see the, the, two different, uh, the two different parts, but that's going to lead to a lot of injuries. And the injuries could be caused by the force of the shockwave, just that compressed air hitting you so hard. You've seen it blow out windows. Imagine what that can do to actual bodies. And then the secondary damage is when these shockwaves, this explosive force destroys objects, little pieces of flying objects go flying everywhere, and then you get damage from the debris itself. And a third type of damage is if the explosion is strong enough, you get thrown into the air, and when you land, there's even more type of injuries. So the primary injury, first, the shock wave hits you, pushes you, can cause damage. Second, the flying debris can hit you. And third, if you are being thrown when you land, you can get even more injuries. Now, a low explosive, here's where we've got to worry about the heat. This often generates a fire. You saw the big fireballs. That's going to create enough heat to actually cause fires. So, that's our discussion, our introduction to explosion, explosives. We've defined both what an explosive is and what an explosion is. We've talked about physical explosions, and we've talked about chemical explosions. And in chemical explosives, there's usually a low explosive and a high explosive. You should know what both of those parts do. You should be able to talk about the three different types of damage that's being caused by an explosion. And next time, we're going to talk briefly about collecting evidence in the explosive scene and talking about how that evidence is being analyzed.